Hello and welcome to the virtual Summer Sacred Music Conference of the Wesleyan Sacred Music Institute. My name is Bryson Mortensen and I'm excited to welcome you to this session presented by Eric Bermani titled Rethinking Repertoire. Since 2008, Eric Bermani has been the Diocesan and Cathedral Director of Music for the Roman Catholic Diocese of Manchester, New Hampshire. He is responsible for all aspects of the Cathedral Music Program, including directing four choral ensembles and his sacred music liaison for those in the diocese. In addition to his cathedral ministry, he is also adjunct professor of organ and sacred music at St. Anselm College. He is also the director of liturgical music, where he is responsible for the 65-member college choir. Eric is finishing up the doctor of ministry degree from Boston University School of Theology, where his research lies in the area of lex orandi, lex credendi, or how sacred music forms believers. Looking forward to this session and hope you are too. Hello everyone, it's great to be with you. My name is Eric Bermani and I'm the Director of Music um, for the Diocese of Manchester, New Hampshire. And I'm also the Director of Music here at the Roman Catholic Cathedral of St. Joseph in Manchester. Um, a church musician um, with 33 years plus of experience, I, I wear several hats. And um, in addition to my responsibilities to the cathedral, I'm also director of liturgical music um, at St. Anselm College. I'm also adjunct professor of organ and of sacred music there. Um, and I'm really blessed because um, since 2008, I've been able to work with, um, any, with about 100 choristers over the course of a week ranging from age from the fourth grade to those up in their um, 80s. And for my seasoned choristers, I will not divulge their names because they, they wouldn't want that information to go out. But it's great to be with you. And um, today I'm going to be speaking about the necessity for us to rethink our repertoire, um, specifically our choral repertoire. And this really is going to be necessary for all of us to undertake, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. So I'm going to briefly um, discuss the impact of COVID-19 on choirs. This gives us a great opportunity to truly evaluate our programs and to keep what works and to maybe discard um, anything that does not work. It's important for us before we begin to really take a moment and to define what worship is for our communities and how music fits into that definition. Of course, that definition um, may be um, different depending on where we're at. Um, in terms of a Roman Catholic context, which where I'm at, I'm at a very liturgical oriented church. And I realize that some of you may not be. However, regardless of our denominations, worships help to carve a particular culture, and churches are meant to provide an alternative lifestyle compared to that of the secular world. If your denomination defines worship as being worldly or representative of the heavenly Jerusalem, care must be taken to ensure our repertoire reflects these core values of our faith tradition. Now, as I said, you know your church much more so than I do. And again, one of the challenges of this presentation is that I can't be too specific because it may not pertain to your, to your particular situation. As I had said earlier, I serve the Roman Catholic Church at both a cathedral parish and a college community. While they're both seemingly different, they both have elements of modeling and of education. This also fits into the overall arc structure of the Roman Catholic Church, which has a particular vision of corporate worship. The music chosen at both of these locations reflects these realities. So the music is, um, particularly the, the choral anthems, fits into the particular ideology, um, but it's also helping to form the particular musicians. Um, in terms of a music educational context. Now, this, our, our ministry is really somewhat complicated now, even more so, because of COVID. 
So more than likely, we need to reteach our choristers how to sing since they've been out of practice. Hopefully they've been practicing at home. Maybe you've had virtual uh, rehearsals or whatnot. But as we're emerging from the pandemic, we're going to really have to refocus our efforts to reteaching our choristers how to sing. This this is going to be a huge task, and I don't think any of us can just walk into our churches and just pretend that it's it's business as uh, usual. Many places are going to have to start back at square one, and I know even for myself, there are going to be some of the choral programs that I'm that I work with that um, we're going to have to take a step back um, and re-educate the choristers before we can really move forward. So this provides us a great opportunity. It's challenging, but it provides a great opportunity for us to really think outside of the box. As I was doing some research to prepare for this, I came across this really fascinating program that I want to share with you. And it's it's definitely music-based, but it's a great example of thinking outside the box. And that's what I want us to kind of focus in on. The program that I'm going to briefly um, share with you is called the Be Like Beethoven program. Even that title is pretty fun, isn't it? Be Like Beethoven. Now, this is an initiative that is put out by the New Bedford Symphony Orchestra. And they have a particular outreach program with 55 schools and exploring the various compositional techniques used by Beethoven that can also serve, interestingly enough, as models to reduce plastic pollution. Now, who would have thought that music could somehow be augmented to curb pollution? Um, but this is a great example, like I said, of thinking outside the box. The idea for the program came from a simple observation that composers such as Beethoven were very resourceful in their ability to create an entire piece of music from a single mu musical idea or motive. Great composers would never throw away a musical idea after one single use. Now, Beethoven would find the potential from each musical idea through reusing or repeating, repurposing or modifying, and recycling or fragmenting the motive throughout a piece of music. So the music, so how it would work is the composer comes up with a musical idea, then that musical idea is repurposed. So it could be inverted, modified, and then it's reused. In Beethoven's situation, he will um, sometimes repeat that musical idea five steps higher. He'll reuse it again six steps higher. And then he'll recycle it so the used material is turned into something new. And then it's repurposed and different parts are added to it. It's augmented. It's expanded. Um, and it develops a life of its own. So the question is, um, and the New Bedford Symphony does a great job, I think, in, again, um, introducing music education into schools and integrating a completely non-musical component. Um, aside from all that, so can we take anything out of that? Like, can we modify Beethoven's approach in our own music ministry? Can we remodify, augment, reuse, um, our existing resources in a different way. Again, that answer is going to be varied depending on where we're at, depending on, on, on the resources that we have, so on and so forth. But um, definitely, you know, I think it would be easy for us um, to almost just to kind of give up and say, well, what are we going to do? coming out of this pandemic? How are we going to move forward? But we can't do that. We've got to pick up the pieces. We have to rethink. And we've got to develop a good plan moving forward. 
So bridging from that, many of us are going to be faced with a situation that we're going to have to rebuild our programs. Before we can really even think about repertoire, we obviously need choristers for that, right? We need singers to sing the choral music. So building a decent-sized choir basically boils down to this. How good you are at convincing people with some basic music skills to commit themselves to, to the music program. Without a minimum number of voices in a balanced section, the greatest director in the world can do very little. Musical considerations then fall into second place until your choir is large enough to function as a choral group rather than an ensemble. So perhaps it helps to point out some statistical facts about the size of our choirs. The group dynamics largely dictate on their own the size of your adult choir. While many think if they work harder to do different music or to give even prizes that they, can, that they alone can seriously increase the size of the choir, these and other activities are minimally effective. What grows choirs the best is, are the group dynamics. So group dynamics determines the size of your choir. With hard work and with some luck, you can raise the top numbers a little bit, but beyond this, it becomes difficult to go much further. Now, research has shown that few churches of any size of membership rarely develop a choir with more than 40 or 45 voices. Moreover, this happens aside from the size of the congregation, the history of the choir, or other external factors. These studies have demonstrated that distinct and consistent group dynamics shape the size of our choirs. So in terms of choral ensembles, there are small groups. The smallest group contains four to seven members and rarely exceeds 10. So these are small communities. It has a tight cohesiveness and is characterized by caring, close relationships. These close bonds develop between the members and problems of any member of the group can strongly affect the other members. As the number approaches 10, the group starts to change and morph into the second category. So we've got the small group between four to seven members, right? Then the next group would be the overgrown small group. Now this group has from eight to 17 members. Characteristically, it has frequent meetings, generally once or twice a week, and has a natural sense of community. This element of community is one of the um, biggest um, motivating factors which contribute to growth of a choir. If you can really emphasize the community aspect of it. Yes, it's within a, a church setting, and we are a community, yes, but even, even in those communities, there are smaller, um, there are smaller communities, and the choir's got to see itself as a, as a community, operating in a larger community. Um, with these groups, yeah, if a member misses, everyone knows, there are strong bonds of caring and support that make this a very comfortable size. Now, many, if not most, church choirs reflect this particular model, even if the congregation exceeds three or 400 on a Sunday morning. Musically, this group can succeed if the sections are balanced by at least three voices in each section. Owning to group dynamics, it takes serious and sustained work to enlarge this group beyond the top figure of 17 or 18 members. If it grows much above this, it then becomes a middle-sized group. So most of our church choirs are in that um, overgrown small group. The next group that we have is the middle-sized group. This group has at least 17 or 18 members on the lower end and upwards of 35 to 40 on the top. It very rarely exceeds 40. These groups typically form service clubs, large Sunday school classes, and many administrative boards and schools and churches. The members share a common cause or task. They remain aware of absent members, and the group functions with good leadership. 
Without this last factor, without the good leadership, it dwindles down to the overgrown small group. So good leadership is is really, well, good leadership is really required for any size choral group, but the more courses that you have, the more that leadership is really required. The middle size group characterizes many choirs and churches with as many as two or 3,000 members. In fact, few adult choirs grow beyond this size owing to the group dynamics. When the group grows much above 40, it changes from a group into an organization. Uh, I'm very blessed. I've got, uh, I suppose, a wide variety of um, choirs that I work with. In our children's choral program, um, we, we have, um, well, whenever they're all together now, we, we have about 21. So that would fall into the overgrown small group. The, the cathedral choir, when they're all together, we have 35 members. Again, that's the higher end of the overgrown small group. Um, I have a diocesan festival chorus that combines everybody. When they're all together, that, that more or less approaches the next group because that has um, upwards of 65 singers. And the college choir that I work with, they too have 65. Um, so your approach um, in, in working with these ensembles is going to change according to the size. I suppose in some respects that's, that's um, common sense, but it's something that we really have to be constantly cognizant of. So when the group goes beyond about 40, it can change from a group into more or less like a, like a organization. And that's usually referred to as a choral organization. This is the final category and they typically have 50 or more members. These dynamics resemble those of a small organization more than a choir. The grouping begins to resemble a collection of subgroups such as the altos or the tenors rather than a cohesive whole. Now this could possibly work against you because this subgroup, like the altos or the tenors or the basses and so forth, could possibly erode that larger sense of community. But yet at the same time, it's also building smaller sub-communities. So once again, you know, you want to make sure that the fiefdoms are kept to a minimum. And we all know um, the dilemmas that those can compose. And we want to try to keep egos at bay. We want to always reinforce the fact that we're a community um, working and collaborating with each other. That's the most important. So moreover, the size of the choir means that some of the singers who feel too exposed in a smaller group can have a degree of anonymity. A choir of this size has great musical potential, but it also has its own particular problems resulting from the considerable range of talents in each section. So that gives us a little breakdown of the various choirs, the potentials of from the smaller groups to the larger groups. Um, again, you know, each of these are going to take on a different life. Um, each church is going to be different. It's difficult to, this isn't like a one size fits all piece of clothing, right? Everything is going to be different depending on your own particular um, set of circumstances. I still believe though that what we have to do, especially now, is we've got to reevaluate what it is that we're doing. And coming out of COVID, we really need to give our choristers um, a um, We need to instill within them a desire to want to come back. Now, a lot are going, uh, quite a lot are going to want to come back as it is because they've they've missed singing. But even with our um, congregations, we have to give them a reason to come back. 
Um, here in the New England region, um, as with everywhere else around the, the country, we, we have really relied on a virtual worship experience. Now we're saying, well, it's now safe to come back to our churches, but we have to kind of put some meat into that. Why, why on earth are they going to want to come back, particularly for places that are still offering worship virtually, which I think is a good idea. But we also have to give a incentive to those people who want to come back. Um, the question is, all right, where can we improve? Where can we build upon our successes? So we really have to evaluate. Like I said before, we have to evaluate and see what's working, ditch what's not working, and really build upon our successes. At the same time, we need to go back and we need to reevaluate what our own denomination defines as worship. Okay, so we've got several moving parts here. Evaluate what's working, what's not. Define our worship and what worship is supposed to mean. And then evaluate and bring into that context relevant and relevant repertoire that's going to help us um, attain these goals. Now, for some smaller churches, um, I know that sometimes resources can be a challenge, right? Everyone talks about, oh, well, you know, um, where can I find the anthems and so, and so on and so on and so forth. So um, a wonderful resource that we have is our hymnals. Hymnals are a great resource and we can use our, we can turn our hymns, basic hymns into anthems. And some may have experience in this, others may not, I don't know. But um, how would you go about that? Take, for example, a hymn. I'm going to take a real simple hymn, um, Old Hundredth. Okay? We can take a hymn from the hymnal. We can zap it into a anthem. You, you First of all, you, you have to write down a plan as to what you're going to do. And you obviously have to communicate that with your choristers. So, for example, you have a hymn. I'm using Old Hundredth as our example. Um, it has four verses in it. Um, you can have the choir sing it through first in unison. Right? You can come up with a great introduction, have the choir sing the first verse in unison. Then you can experiment with parts. Maybe have um, sopranos and altos, or soprano tenor, whatever voice parts that you you have, um, you know, experiment with those parts. You can try it a cappella, right? So have the first verse in unison, a company, then try the second verse a cappella. You can also modulate into a higher key. So start off in F, modulate to G. You can use it for your accompaniment to provide some harmonic interest. So you can take a bunch of already existing resources, combine them into one, um, and turn a hymn into an anthem. Um, there's also opportunities to take a hymn and to turn it into a canon. Many of our hymnals will have an index at the back that will say hymns being able to be sung in canons or in rounds. Okay? That also provides a great opportunity um, to take a hymn um, and to zap it into an anthem. We can also take a look at um, utilizing music, which was originally conceived as solo material. Okay, maybe perhaps you've got um, some solo repertoire in your church library that you can probably maybe have the trouble sing part of it, or have the tenors and basses sing. I mean, you know, 
definitely take a look at some of your solo repertoire. Uh, for those churches that are short on trebles, maybe you can consider forming or engaging with the children's choir, especially for the upper registers. Um, again, I don't know what your resources are, but working with children's voices can oftentimes be a lot of fun and will really open up um, some great possibilities. So don't be afraid. Um, yeah, obviously, um, of course, you know, you have to check with your churches for, you know, um, for necessary workshops pertaining to the safety of children and, um, and, you know, whatever the legal ramifications are, make sure that all that's done before you, um, you, 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 you jump down that rabbit hole and make sure that all that is uh, taken care of because that's ex of extreme importance. Um, but we should really be thinking about establishing children's choral programs in an effort to get as many children as possible to sing because the children are our future generations of um, choristers. And that's even, you know, educating children to sing and to sing church music is really something that each and every church must be undertaking, especially with the decline of um, fine arts in our school systems. And again, COVID is impacting that, right? Shrinking budgets. The first thing to go are the fine arts. Um, so, you know, churches really need to be investing in a children's choral program because um, the churches have got to step up I, 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 I can't emphasize that enough. Churches have got to step up to educate children to sing because they're not getting it anywhere else. Um, getting back to our repertoire, you can also um, take a look at some of the um, real simple ostinato refrains such, such as music from, from, um, from the Tizay community. Uh, if you're not familiar with with um, with you know Tizé, uh, it's a French ecumenical group, and um, they have wonderful, very spiritual music. That um, a lot of it is just short ostinato refrains. You can do it in unison, or like I said, similar um, two-part harmony, three-part harmony, four-part harmony. Um, Rounds exist. It's all um, you. You can do it accompanied a cappella. You can add obligato instrumentation. You can do a thousand things with it, and becomes extremely, extremely prayerful. So, you can check some of that out. Um, I believe GIA Publications. They're based out of uh, Chicago. Um, they uh, they um, publish collections of the Tizay music. So definitely check that out. Um, you can also adapt SATB music for either um, soprano and alto or soprano alto tenor or even soprano alto bass. So you can you can you can take a look at existing repertoire, try to modify it, and you can also look for easier arrangements. Uh, and it's okay to tackle easier settings of larger works such as Messiah. Plenty of of um, of arrangements of Messiah. Um, I, I believe some of them are called like Messiah Made Simple. Uh, it, and it's, um, it's, easy, it's easier um, settings of like the Hallelujah Chorus. Um, these gems that, that, that churches should be exposed to. But let's face it, not everyone has the choral resources to pull off a four-part choir singing the Hallelujah Chorus. Um, but some may be able to do it with soprano and alto bass. Those resources are available. So it's just a question about finding them and tapping into that, okay? It's important that we know all of the major publishers, especially those who are the major players for your genre. So that's really important. Um, you know, if you have a traditional based Choral program, it's important for you to know who are the major publishers for um, traditionally based um, choral works. If, you've, if you're in a lot of contemporary music, uh, it's important for you to know what are your resources 
um, your publishing houses that are dealing with the um, contemporary music genre. Okay, so it's really important that you have a good um, understanding of what those resources are. You can also explore the greatness of the internet, especially Coral Wiki. <laughs> especially Coral Wiki. I tell you, it's just, if you don't know what it is, definitely check it out. They've got thousands of free resources that you may be able to use in your settings. Um, a lot of them are in, uh, actually all of it is in the public domain or they are um, written, um, arranged specifically for it. And uh, it's just a great resource. Um, there are some choral gems which are useful for any sized choir. Um, and again, in terms of repertoire, you know, you want to choose music, which is always, of course, within the, the capabilities of your choristers, but you also want to choose music which, which they're going to benefit from educationally, right? What pieces are going, what pieces will help teach your choristers to sing. And these, these, these gems are usually found in the great um, canon of choral literature. Some people will shy away from it thinking that their choirs can't sing it. Um, I don't believe in that. I believe if your choirs can sing, if you've got enough for four parts, and if your choirs can sing two measures in four parts, they can do anything, okay? Um, in, terms of, in terms of choral leadership, I think you know we can we can learn a great lesson from those who who are teaching elementary school students. Uh, as an elementary school teacher, the number one rule is your your students will only be as good as what you allow them to be. Okay, if you have a bar set here, your students are going to work to hit that bar. If your bar is set here, your your students are going to work to set that bar. So I believe um, it's important for each of us to, to know our singers, to teach them and to nourish them, but to also push them because the more they sing, the better musicians that they can be. So a couple of good choral gems. Some may already be using this repertoire. Some may find it brand new. I don't know, but... Um, Thomas Atwood's Teach Me, O Lord. Wonderful. <laughs> Johann Sebastian Bach's Yes, the Joy of Man is Desiring. Classic, it's beautiful, and it's relatively easy. Mozart's Jubilate Deo, another great piece of choral literature. It's in Latin. For those of you that are able to use Latin, definitely check it out. There's some um, editions of it in the public domain, and there's some other ones. Uh, I believe that Richard Prue has a fairly newer setting by him, published by GIA also. Richard Ferenc, Lord, for thy tender mercy's sake. Excellent. Also by Richard Ferenc, Hide not thou thy face from us. Great.
Thomas Tallis's If You Love Me. And finally, um, Petonius Cantate Domino. Excellent. My college kids um, go around campus uh, singing the Petoni Cantati Domino, uh, like all over the place. Like, who would ever thought that college kids would be running around singing choral music? But I'm very blessed. For all of these, different settings are available. The Talus is in SATB, but there's also a setting for SAB. Um, you can also find them for SA, so different arrangements um, do exist. In terms of repertoire, um, it's important that we also recognize your community's um, geography, your, your you know, ecosystem. And this can be a new concept for us because we don't usually, we, we, we typically think of our churches more of a, parochial sense or like more of a more of an individual sense okay so what do I mean by your church's geography or by your church's ecosystem I actually kind of like that the you know ecosystem um, analogy better because that makes us think that our church is connected to something else Okay, so what is your church connected to in terms of a social circle, in terms of um, a geographical set, um, circle? What is in your various areas? And this can also help shape and form our repertoire. Perhaps you're able to partner with some local churches or, yes, even synagogues for some, for some special events, you know, um, it's great for us to pool resources. There's nothing um, prohibiting us from working with our neighbors across the street. You know, if you're facing particular choral challenges, maybe the Baptist church across the street is facing the same choral challenges. Reach out to them, introduce yourself, grab a cup of coffee and see where maybe you can possibly collaborate, okay? Um, partner with your local schools, reach out, see what's going on. Um, that can be a wonderful resource. Um, so, you know, your local schools, your high schools, if you happen to have local community music schools, reach out to them, see what's going on. What's most important is that you don't ever give up because giving up is, is completely opposite to the Christian mission. So, um, that pretty much wraps up my, my um, presentation on rethinking repertoire. I know that due to COVID, it had to be virtual, so on and so forth. I, I wish that we could all be, be together because I think I could um, learn a lot from each of you. And I would also be able to give a lot more um, I think concrete suggestions because as it is now, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't really know. Um, I know that as colleagues, we're all serving churches, uh, but I'm not able to kind of develop uh, a sense as to, um, as to, as to what your, your stories are and as to what your, your, you know, particular challenges are as to what is and to what, um, community that you are working with. Um, so my, I, I, I will give you my, my, you know, contact information and the contact information will also appear at the bottom of the screen. 
But you can feel free to email me at ebermani, that's E-B-E-R-M-A-N-I, at St. Joseph, S-T-J-O-S-E-P-H, Cathedral, C-A-T-H-E-D-R-A-L-N-H, dot org. And again, it's going to appear at the bottom. So thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Know of my continued thoughts and prayers to each of you. Um, and, um, and I wish you the best as we emerge from COVID and continue the good work that you do for your churches. Thanks so very much. Take care.